At this point, I just want to mention a few special bacterial species which you should be aware of because they have special susceptibilities to specific antibiotics. Pseudomonas is a gram-negative bacilli that is relatively common and is resistant to many antibiotics. It can colonize the respiratory tract and cause respiratory tract infections, particularly in the setting of structural lung disease like underlying bronchiectasis, and it is also a cause of urinary tract infections, as well as sometimes skin and soft tissue infections with a characteristic green appearance. Pseudomonas is generally only covered by broad-spectrum intravenous antibiotics such as gentamicin, amikacin, meropenem, piperacillin tazobactam, when dose 6 hourly, kefepim, and keftazidine. Importantly, the carbapenem ertapenem does not have good activity against pseudomonas and other common broad-spectrum antibiotics like keftriaxone and amoxicillin clavulanic acid does not cover pseudomonas either. The only widely available oral option for pseudomonas is that of ciprofloxacin and hence care should be taken when prescribing ciprofloxacin as if a pseudomonas becomes resistant to ciprofloxacin there will no longer be any widely available oral option for this patient and you'll be committing the patient to long courses of intravenous antibiotic which of course will take up hospital resources as an inpatient admission or under the hospital and the home services. More recently, the oral carbapenem tebipenem does have some pseudomonas activity, however this is still not widely available in most of the world. So therefore, when pseudomonas is suspected as a possible etiology for a respiratory tract infection in a patient with underlying structural lung disease who has previous evidence of pseudomonas colonization then the empirical antibiotic regimen should contain pseudomonas cover. For example, intravenous piperacillin tazobactam dosed at 6 hourly, assuming normal renal function. Another relatively resistant organism is that of Enterococcus, a gram-positive cocci, for which there are two main species, Enterococcus faecalis and Enterococcus faecium, with the latter being somewhat more resistant than the former. Enterococcus can cause intra-abdominal, gut, and urinary infections, and is not an uncommon cause of infective endocarditis as well. It is important to be aware that Enterococcus are resistant to all cephalosporins by having incompatible inhibition of their penicillin binding proteins. And so if Enterococcus is suspected, such as in an elderly patient with urinary tract infections, one should try and avoid cephalosporin monotherapy such as keftriaxone as empirical therapy as this may not be covering enterococcus if it turns out to be the underlying organism. Ampicillin is usually the antibiotic of choice to cover enterococcus faecalis and keftriaxone can be given in synergy with a penicillin such as ampicillin when treating infective endocarditis caused by enterococcus. Patients who've had several courses of antibiotics or in community dwelling areas or have had recurrent hospitalizations are at increased risk of getting multi-resistant organisms such as VRE or vancomycin resistant enterococcus. While these can be just colonizers, they can also cause infections and if they do, they can be very difficult to treat with options being high-end antibiotics such as linezolid and daptomycin. There are a number of different vancomycin-resistant enterococci phenotypes which are labeled Van A, B, C and so on. Van A resistance is quite common and makes it resistant to both vancomycin and tycoplanin, whereas a Van B resistance phenotype makes it sensitive to tycoplanin and that becomes an option to treat this. Another group of important multi-resistant bacteria are that of the ESBLs, which stands for Extended Spectrum Beta-Lactamase Producing Bacteria. 
These are usually gram-negative bacteria such as Escherichia coli or E. coli or Klebsiella, which, as its name implies, produces a beta-lactamase that confers resistance to a number of beta-lactam antibiotics, usually characterized by keftriaxone resistance, and subsequently resistance to all earlier generations of beta-lactams. ESBL organisms are most reliably covered by broad-spectrum antibiotics such as carbapenems, specifically meropenem. Previously, piperacillin tazobactam was also used, but it has been shown in the Merino trial that meropenem is superior to piperacillin tazobactam for covering severe ESBL infections. And so, if a patient has a history of or is found to have an ESBL, meropenem is the optimum antibiotic that should be used. This is why in cases of febrile neutropenia, where patients present with low neutrophil counts and fevers and may not have a clear localizing source of infection because they are unable to mount a neutrophil innate inflammatory response. Broad spectrum antibiotics such as piperacillin tazopactam are usually empirically given, but if ESBL remains a concern or the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then using meropenem may be better than using piperacillin tazobactam. MRSA or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, like VRE, is a multi resistant organism that is a common colonizer, in the case of MRSA being a skin colonizer in patients who have had recurrent causes of antibiotics or recurrent hospital admissions or live in community dwelling areas. Broadly speaking, Staphylococcus aureus can be classified into PSSA or penicillin sensitive Staph aureus if it is sensitive to penicillins and essentially most of the beta lactams, MSSA or methicillin sensitive Staphylococcus aureus where the Staph aureus is sensitive to either methicillin or oxacillin where methicillin is only used in the lab and is a surrogate marker for susceptibility to flucloxacillin and then MRSA where there's resistance to oxacillin or methicillin which means that flucloxacillin will not be effective for MRSA. MRSA can be further divided into the traditional classification of hospital acquired MRSA and community acquired MRSA with hospital acquired being more multi-resistant including to all penicillins and cephalosporins as well, except for the fifth generation cephalosporins, whereas the community acquired MRSA tends to still be susceptible to some oral options such as clindamycin and trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole. For hospital acquired and also community acquired Staphylococcus aureus, vancomycin is usually the treatment of choice. And this can be used empirically in patients who present with possible Staph aureus infections, particularly in skin and soft tissue infections and infective endocarditis, especially if they have underlying risk factors for MRSA, such as the recurrent hospitalizations, recurrent antibiotic use, previous MRSA colonization, or living in community dwelling areas. Thankfully, at least for now, vancomycin intermediate and vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus are very uncommon. Treatment options for these are limited to things like daptomycin, keftaroline, and linezolid. Another important group of bacterial organisms are that of the Escapum bacteria, which stands for Enterobacter, Seracia species, Citrobacter species, Acinetobacter or Eremonas species, non mirabilis Proteus species such as Proteus vulgaris, Providentia, and Morganella. These organisms are special in that they produce an inducible beta lactamase known as AMPA-C, such that initial treatment with a cephalosporin such as keftriaxone leads to the production of this inducible beta lactamase and therefore leads to resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics 
such as keftriaxone and piperacillin tazobactam. To sufficiently treat these organisms, you have to use carbapenem such as meropenem. These organisms are all gram-negative bacilli and hence can cause intra-abdominal infections. And so if you come across a situation where a patient has a suspected intra-abdominal infection and you give them keftriaxone and they initially get better but then start to get worse, one of the considerations you should have is that they may have an escapum organism, in which case escalating to meropenem may be appropriate. And lastly, we have C. diff, previously known as Clostridium difficile, but recently renamed to Clostridioides difficile. This is a gram-positive bacilli, which in some people is a normal colonizer of the gut, and under drug pressure from antibiotics, which can wipe out significant proportions of the normal gut flora, C. diff is able to then overgrow and become pathogenic and cause C. diff colitis or pseudomembranous colitis. Treatment for C. diff includes oral vancomycin, which is effective because of its very poor bioavailability, meaning that almost all of the vancomycin that is taken as a tablet remains in the gut with very little systemic absorption and therefore makes it very effective at treating C. diff, which of course is a gram-positive organism, for which vancomycin, being a glycopeptide, is effective against. Other treatment options include oral metronidazole, which is less preferred than oral vancomycin, in mild to moderate cases. In more severe cases, the combination of oral vancomycin with intravenous metronidazole may be required along with potentially surgery, with a colectomy of the affected bowel. Fidaxomycin is another option that can be used, but generally this is only used for mild to moderate cases. In terms of prevention, an effective treatment is that of fecal microbiota transplant, or FMT, where donors with healthy gut flora have samples transplanted to the affected patient. Monoclonal antibodies have also been developed targeting the various toxins of C. diff and can hence prevent recurrent C. diff infections, namely actoximab and bezlatoximab. But ultimately, an important part of managing C. diff infection is to reduce the antibiotic drug pressure. As often, C. diff arises from preceding antibiotic use. Now I'd like to go through some basic pharmacology to help you better understand how to use antibiotics.